excited today because we have a guest who's been joining us and who spent a whole day at Kapalama, a whole day uh, on the Maui campus, and is actually spending mid-morning through this afternoon at the Keahau campus. And she is speaking to administrators, curriculum coordinators, counselors, kumu, um, about neuroscience and learning. She is from Haya, and she is glad to be back. She currently resides in Quito, Ecuador, and she is a, uh, a Harvard University uh, Extension School professor. She has published six books, 144 presentations, uh, 34 countries that she works with. Um, what was the other stat? There's, there's just all kinds of stats, like if you watch basketball, like the Russell Westbrook, if you will, and James Harden. So, um, really excited, and just to introduce her last is to share with you her philosophy. It's a very simple philosophy, and I think it's emblematic of what you'll hear today in terms of learning about how education is very different than it was when we all went to school. It looks different, it feels different, and as a result, we sometimes are not really sure we buy into it. But the difference with education today is that it's tied to science. And her philosophy is simple. It's the philosophy of one. One student, one teacher. So let's welcome Tracy Tokulama Espinosa. Yeah, thank you. This is really like a, a homecoming. You know, I, I love this so much. I ended up, my father went off to um, California, so that's where I spent most of my time. Then I went to further east coast, then down south. But every time I come back here, it's like, oh, it's so wonderful to be back here. So thank you so much for giving me your time this morning. I know that you're such busy people. So carving out this little niche to, to learn about some things, uh, learn about our own brains, is uh, really something I, I hope it will be beneficial for all of us. Um, first question, why do human beings write? To remember. And one thing we're going to learn today is that there is no learning without memory and without attention. So, if you don't have something to write with, right, you know, make sure that you ask the person next to you, hey, you need to Okay, try it because I'm going to ask you to write a couple things. The very first thing I'm going to ask you to write down is my email. I love corresponding with people who care about learning more about this information. And this morning we're going to introduce a bunch of things, but we probably won't go really deep into any one. And you might feel like, but I want to know more about how the sleep, how sleep impacts my learning. Or I really want to understand how emotions uh, influence cognition. Or I really want to go deeper. Uh, into that information about the, is, is there really a big change in adolescent brains or not or whatever. So we know that memory is important. This is why I'm asking you to write down the email. But I also want you to explore uh, on the webpage, thelearningsciences.com. In the courses I teach at Harvard, we do this what's in what's called a flipped manner. So I would recommend this for meetings, too. You send a video beforehand that explains all of the core concepts, information, facts that we want to make sure everybody gets so that when we come together, we can have the discussion around that information, right? So all the videos that I have for my course are also uploaded there for free viewing for in case you would like to, to go deeper into memory or attention systems or how uh, nutrition influences learning or things like that, okay? Okay, so that's the first thing. So everybody got something to write with? Yes? Okay. What we're going to do is spend about a few minutes, maybe five, ten minutes, I want to explain something about uh, the context of education, and I'm going to dive really into the brain. But I'm going to warn you that at the very end, we have just a few minutes left, I'm going to ask you for something that's called three, two, one. Three things that you didn't know before we began today. Two things that you say, this is so interesting, I want to know more. Yeah? And one thing that you're going to think about, well, maybe I'm going to change this in my personal professional life based on the information that I learned. And I ask you to do this because anytime you go to any kind of a session where somebody pretends that they're going to be teaching you something, you better walk out feeling satisfied. Oh, yeah, I really learned something. I'm really curious about something new. And now, what am I going to do about it? How can this be usable knowledge? And that's a big deal in my profession is that there's a lot of information coming out of science, but how does that translate into real life? What does that really look like 
when you try to apply it, okay? So I want to see if we can move to that point of actual application, okay? We know that there have been a lot of changes in education. Do you think your educational system is perfect? Yeah. Is it perfectable? Yes, we can get better, right? Okay. So does anybody remember who this fellow is? Do you know who Rip Van Winkle is? What did he do? Yeah. He fell asleep. And when he woke up, everything had changed. Transportation had changed. He figured out banking is all different. You can tweet people in and out of government now. Elections are different. Supermarkets are different. And schools? <laughs> which of these is 1910 and which is 2010? They are both 2010. That's what's so depressing, right? OK, I have been to the command of schools. They do not look like this. OK, but still, what's the point? What's the point of this? Education is the slowest institution in society to catch up with real, the real change, the real possibilities of what it could be. Other industries have really moved forward really quickly, but education is so slow to adapt to these things, okay? So I want to tell you, I'm going to give you four reasons why we must change general education, because what I'm going to tell you about your brain should be common knowledge from here on out, okay? So why should we change education? We know that we need to change education for four reasons. One is that we have different expectations of what school is for. And there's a lot of them listed here. We're not going to go, oops, we're not going to go into all of them. But the idea is that before, when you and I were going to school, to know was enough, right? Your teachers came in, and they knew a lot of stuff. And you were like, whoa, this guy knows so much, and he's so smart. And, OK, so you think that was enough. But now, kids go to school, and on their telephones, they might know more stuff than the teacher would know. They might know more about topics, right? So we know that education has shifted drastically in terms of what we expect schools to do. We expect schools to help kids have transdisciplinary thinking, to have different types of value systems, to learn how to collaborate and work together. We expect different types of things that are not necessarily a part of traditional education. So expectations on the whole have changed, OK? They've also changed is what we think of what the student does and what the teacher does. What do we expect is the end deal? What is the quality of our teacher really measured by? And if you look at the sum of the literature on these 21st century skills, but now that we're 17, 18 years into the 21st century, we should have figured out what this means. We talk about people who know, uh, who have uh, intellectual curiosity. People have intellectual cur courage. And they have uh, a difference of opinion, they're able to say, I don't agree with that, right? People who have intellectual generosity. They come around, across something and say, oh, this is, this is not for me, but I bet you'd be interested in it. And I just send this over to you, just in case you find it interesting. You share what you know, right? We want people who embrace complexity. The world is not simple, right? There's a lot of complexity out there. We want people who know how to work with people who are different from ourselves, who look different who act different, who have different value systems. Can you get along with those people? Can you work autonomously? Yeah, not the president. <laughs> that's a lost cause. Oh, that's on tape. Okay. That's on tape. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we know that we have different types of goals, but what we tell the teachers when we work with them is that if we're looking at that this is also part of school, it's just not math, reading, writing. It is also forming this individual you want to live with in society, right? That's a very big shift from what we used to put on schools, OK? But I tell teachers, we can't get there unless they themselves have all of these characteristics and more. So most teachers have a lot hard time. And they think, hey, let me think about what it is I need to improve there. What is the piece of this that most teachers are, have a hard time saying, oh, I can do that? Which is the one that's the biggest challenge for most teachers? What would you guess? Act autonomously in some school systems, because they have been so used to just waiting for, OK, what does the principal say? What does the principal say? Some schools, but some, uh, there's some pretty autonomous teachers, especially in your school. <laughs> so I think that's not one. What would be another one? Tech savvy. That's actually the number one around the world 
The average teacher in the world today is 40 years old, and most of them have never had a class in anything related to technology. Most of them have never experienced even the basics of understanding how to do everything in Word, for example. They just don't know how to do this. So um, we know that that's a big challenge for our teachers because the kids are super tech savvy and they oftentimes know far more and they actually feel very uh, bored sometimes in schooling systems because their teachers can't keep up with the latest app that can do other things or reverse uh, mathematical learning or whatever faster than the teacher can. Okay. So anyways, this is a th another change. The third change is basically what you guys are here for. Information has changed drastically thanks to better technology about the brain and how it learns. And this means that we've gone from things like these cartoon drawings, every single one of those things that's up there is a myth, okay? There's no right brain, left brain, 10% brain, boys and girls brains, uh, reptilian brains, learning styles, multitasking, all that is out, okay? We've gone from that because when we have better technology, we now know how complex the brain really is. We look at things that show blood flow. We look at things that show changes in chemical compositions. We look at things that change the structure of the brain. And we can even measure what's called, do you guys know what white matter is? You heard of white matter and green matter? Yeah? No? Never heard of that? Brain matter is just the cell body in your brain, okay? All the cells that you have. So this would be, when in, in, your, in the nervous system, a cell is called a neuron. So that's why it's called a neuron, right? So you have neurons that are cells in your nervous system. And the body is what is gray matter. But when you learn something, you basically have new connections between these areas. And that strengthen glial cells. This is called myelination. And the speed of the electrical signal that goes from one part of your brain to the other gets faster with more white matter, OK? So we can measure increases in white matter that show us if somebody has learned something. Okay, so we can mix all of these things together now, and you come up with the most modern type of, uh, of technology. It's on the bottom there. It's called the Connectome Project. If you look online, it's very cool because it's this multi-million dollar international project to join brain imagery to come up with single scans in which they compare fMRIs, with PET scans, with EEGs, with all these other things together, so you have a better sense of where the networks are in the brain. How is the brain actually learning things? So then you can go to these ideas and expand this by understanding. There is no such thing as, oh, language is your left hemisphere and space is in your right hemisphere or creativity or whatever. There is no such thing as localizationalism anymore. We don't say something is in one part of your brain, okay? What we now talk about are these really fabulous networks that have to all be primed before that particular learning is visible in behavior, okay? So what we will see are things when you have these bigger uh, bubbles here, this is sort of reinforcing that that's a key hub. And hubs are where the message goes through many times through that same space. So with old technology, for example, we used to see things like um, Roca's area would light up with all these things, so this would be for language, right? Roca or Roca's area, and we think, ah, oh, language is there. But that's just because it's a key hub. With better and more intricate technology, it's obviously important, but it's not where language is. We know that humor interpretation or intonation, other things are in far other, in completely distinct networks from Roca and Roca's area. So you no longer say that some piece of learning is in one part of your brain or another, we always talk about networks from here on out, okay? You're making a face at me. What does that mean? What's the question? <laughs> so I have an autistic son. Uh -huh. We've had so much challenges. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, they always say, well, you really can learn so much, you can learn so much. It just makes me wonder, are these applications available? He's 21 off it, and he's doing great. I'm just wondering, wow. Oh, exactly. Had you known this before? Well, this is the one thing that's so fantastic, but it's never too late. When does your brain stop learning? When you die. Okay, so you have time to learn things. Obviously, I always say, the earlier the better, just because the longer, the, the more time you have with an intervention, the better the benefits can be for the whole rest of your life. But it's never the end of things. And I want you to write me because my TA this semester in my courses, especially so 
So we know that there's different ways that the brain is going to be connected for different types of um, abilities. The powerful thing we tell teachers, it takes at least 16 different neural networks which branch out into 109 different pathways, which branch out into more or less 171 visible behaviors. 109 different types of things have to be stimulated before a kid can even read. Now, if that's the complexity of something like reading, can you imagine, think about your jobs, which I think are a lot more intense than only reading. You guys do reading and all kinds of other things, right? Which means the complexity of the brain is what we try to impress upon teachers. It is not as simplistic as, you know, wiggle your ears and you'll feel like reading, which Rain Jim does, that's a myth, okay? Yes, it's on tape, it's on tape, okay? It's not <laughs> and why some people feel that it is, oh, but it worked for me, it's because of something called the placebo effect, okay? If the little kid is so desperate, he really wants to read, and he thinks, okay, I'm going to read better, I'm going to read better, he reads better. So there's a small percentage of people who will actually be top, they can talk themselves into these silly things working, which really have no science at all behind them, okay? And the fourth big change that has occurred is that we now have better information to measure what really influences learning. How do people learn best? So we now have more longitudinal studies looking, tracking different types of people over their lifespan and how they learn or not learn. We can now compare internationally what differences might or might not exist. What is true for all brains, all human brains, at all ages, and what might have slight variations based on culture, but mainly on cultural artifacts, like how we write. So for example, in Japanese, if you write 21, you write ni, ju, ichi, right? That looks 2, 10, 1. That sounds totally logical. Compared to 2, 1, which now, in our stylized versions of Arabic numerals, the kid thinks 3. <laughs> because it doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense, the numbers that we have in Arabic. So the pathway is slightly different for how a Japanese might interpret numbers from how we might interpret Arabic numerals. Did you know that before, when Arabic numerals were first written, it made sense? Because one had one angle, two had two angles, three had three. But we don't, now we write, you know, all different ways, so there's no logic in the brain for that, right? Okay, so we know what we try to teach teachers is there's a really big complexity here and that there is things that are going to be unique about different types of populations, too. And finally, we can finally compare, thanks to John Hattie's really monumental work in educational research, comparing quantitative and qualitative methodologies. He has what he calls a basic effect size, what has a stronger impact based on a thousand meta-analyses. He's, on, he's done a meta-analysis of more than a thousand meta-analysis of what influences student learning outcomes. And using that scale, we can say, well, yes, being born low birth weight or in poverty can have certain impacts on your potential to learn. And so can teacher clarity in the classroom as well as communication skills or, or different methodologies of teaching. So he's put on a single scale, looking at all of these different things together. So combine information from neuroscience and better information about what really makes people learn. That's the new vision of where education is going. So this means, we're going to skip this one. The one thing that has bubbled to the surface that's kind of exciting and kind of scary is that we found, even though if you begin to teach teachers or teach humans, anybody, anybody who's learning, some of this factual information, many people will still cling to what they believe because it's a part of you. More or less about the age of eight or nine, we, we come up with this idea of a theory of brain. I know how I learn. I know how I learn. And you think about that and you confirm this throughout your lifespan. You think, oh, I need to listen to that, and then if I write it down three times, I say it over and over again, that's how I learn best. You figured it out. And you basically reinforce that year after year after year after year until you're 28, 38, 48, 58, and you're so stuck in the way of thinking that even if I present all the facts in the world right now, some of you are going to still say, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true for me. At least that's not true for me. 
I can tell you, learning styles is a myth. But if you have been told throughout your lifespan and in school until you got here, somebody says, but you're a very auditory person or you're a very visual learner, if you've been told that so long, it's really hard for you to let go of it because it's almost part of your identity, right? So I'm going to ask what those of you who were here earlier this morning with this scene is so beautiful. Can you suspend your beliefs for a second? Just listen, hear me out, and let's think if you can open your mind a little bit and think, is it possible? And if I tell you something that just sort of totally clashes what you have thought for the past 40 years, let it go for a minute. And let's just see if we can get some new information in here to sort of mix it around, think about it a little bit more, okay? So open yourself up to that idea. The key idea here is what we've been working with your teachers on is that to get them to go, old school is old school. Before it was enough to know things and to show up. Now we are asking teachers to deal with the most complex organism in the universe, their brains. They have to think, you guys use your brains every single day. How many of you have thought about how you really are learning? Most of us never take the time even to think, how do I know? How do I learn? That's the first exercise I do with my students in the class in Harvard. The first discussion board is, how do you think, you, how do you learn best? When are your best learning moments? How do you learn best? And most of them say, well, since I'm such a visual learner, I really need to do that, and I need to have my coffee in the morning, and after a little exercise, I can really focus, or whatever. <laughs> and they have these things that they've read in the magazines, or whatever, and they've been told, or whatever. But after 15 weeks of class, they have very different answers, right? Because they really appreciate how complicated the brain is, and they're able to think in a different way, okay? So this is what we're trying to get teachers to do, is to appreciate that designing anything in education without knowing the brain is kind of like asking you to sew a glove without understanding the hand. How can we do this? How can teachers pretend to be the most efficient in intervening in classrooms without understanding the brain, at least at the basics? So this is the big shift that's occurring now in education around the world. So this combines information from this field of mind, brain, health, and education, what we know from psychology, education, neuroscience, nutrition, chemistry, biology, taking the learning sciences, combining it with the information you might have from Hattie, and coming up with a whole new way that teachers will be trained in a hierarchical fashion, instead of just bring spaghetti in the wall of professional development, whatever, whatever, whatever. We have an order of things that they need to learn, okay? So this new order is, is pretty powerful, and it actually is a new way of thinking about it. And this is, I'm so pleased to hear that in, in the Kamehameha schools we're reviewing this, okay? Where do we begin with each of the groups? And they're excited about it too, so hopefully this is going to take off uh, within your group. Because it's a direct reflection of what was recommended to 34 nations for the OECD um, report. I had the, the honor of working on part three of this and looking at, okay, so what is now new teachers' new pedagogical knowledge, what do teachers now need to know in the modern era to be able to be you know, efficient teachers, okay? So that's where we're going with this. We explain to the teachers, and this is where it comes down to you. The first thing is to get rid of the myths in society, what people think about the brain that just isn't true, but it's been repeated so often. I don't know if you've ever heard of this phenomenon when people get into an echo chamber of information and they hear the same thing over and over again, they believe it. Ever heard of that happening? Like in modern politics? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this is the idea. How do we get away from just what I'm used to reading, hearing this over and over, seeing 10% of your brain is used in the newspaper every other day? How can I get away from that and get to the real science? So, the first thing we teach teachers is to get rid of the bad information. The second thing we teach teachers are only six core principles, six things that the neuroscientists, this is only last year, 2017, agreed we can tell teachers this is valid information from the laboratory that is true for human beings for all human beings these six little things okay and these 21 other things so the six things include things like your brain is plastic until you die there's no set no learning without memory and attention right all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience right your brain changes every day uh, at a molecular level even before you have changes in behavior right so there's six things there and Chad will share them with you because I already shared the folder with him, so he has all the information and the videos. And the videos. So there's a video for each of one of the principles of the six things, right? And then there's 21 things that are also true, 
but there's a huge amount of human variation, so you have to be very careful. For example, do you think motivation is important for learning? Yes. Yeah, but what motivates you might not motivate him, right? So motivation is important, but there's a big variation. Do you think that sleep is important for learning? Yes. Oh yeah, you feel it right now. Okay. <laughs> We know that sleep is vital for learning, but we also know that anywhere between four and a half and 12 hours is normal. Eight hours is average. So nobody can dictate to another person what they need in terms of, of sleep, right? So we know that there's these 21 things that have this variability in humanity, but it's all true, right? After that, we ask them then, okay, let's integrate the element of culture. Then we can say, this is what you should be doing in your classroom. Okay, so it's a different kind of a process to help teachers get up to speed here. So what we're going to ask you to do right now, help me out here. Got that piece of paper? This is something called a one-minute essay. On any piece of paper you have, or on your computer, or on your telephone, I'm going to give you 60 seconds, and you only have to do two things. Name at least one thing you know about your brain and learning, and one thing you want to know, or you think might be a a myth and you want clarification, okay? So something you know and something you want to know. You have 60 seconds individually. Please do this. Go. With one other person next to you, maximum two. Just say, I know this and I want to know this. Here's the deal. The other person, if they say, oh, you want to know why um, math is in the right hemisphere or something, and the other person says, no, don't you remember? She said there's no such thing as localization. If you can answer what the person, the person knows something that is wrong, correct them. <laughs> and if they want to know something and you know the answer, tell them, okay? What we're looking for is things that bubble to the surface, things that nobody knows, okay? So go, you have two minutes just to share with one other person, please. Something you know and something you want to know. Well, 
understand later, this, this is called cognitive load. The cognitive load that you deal with in order to learn something, that energy that you're using in order to learn something can be economized if you already know something about the new thing, right? So the first thing your brain does is checks for those things, okay? So those are the, that's the simplest answer about how does your brain learn anything. First it's checking for prior knowledge and then it's looking for new information. So with that as a premise, I want to know, what is something you want to know? All that chatter, nobody wants to know. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, is there, can we talk about the networks, the 16 networks, or the other networks that go, is there a way that the brain can uh, overload point in which there's too much traffic going on in the networks that would have negative implications? Very interesting question. So we know that there are multiple networks that are required for learning, okay? So if, okay, sorry. So the question is that we know that there's multiple networks that are required for learning. So is there any moment that a brain could become overloaded by so much happening at the same time, okay? Which is precisely why that within schooling, for example, for reading, let's use that as the example, there's one network related to symbol to sound, right? One network does something like that, right? Another network is for semantic memory. What is the meaning of that word? Another network relates to working memory. And I remember the beginning of the letter of the word by the end of the word. So those things have to happen simultaneously. Normally in school, we try to rehearse each of these networks with different activities. Each, each network requires a different kind of stimulus for it to work, right? So therefore, normally within school settings, we're actually doing these actually one at a time, reinforcing certain networks at different times. But in order to have the action to be able to show you can read, you have to combine all of those. And this is what's so interesting. A brain that's just learning something new is all over the place. You look at a brain scan of a new reader, and it's a mess. They're trying to connect all kinds of stuff all over the place, right? But if you look at an efficient reader, somebody who reads really well, they basically pruned away all the extra fluff and they're so efficient. You use far less energy in your brain when you are an expert in something, okay? So when you first learn to drive, like your brain will go. You are all over the place, heavy energy load, total focus, right? Wait, you know how to drive, right? Yeah? Okay, so you remember when you learned how to drive? Was it painful? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so we know there's a lot of energy that is used for new learning. But now, you probably don't even think about it. Some days you can get in the car, especially on Friday. You get home, you don't even know how you got there, right? Because it's automated, it's automated, right? And totally, it's something that has been habituated. This in the brain is because that myelin sheath, that white matter, has been enforced, so reinforced so much that the speed of the signal is so quick, it's automated, okay? So your learning becomes automatic. The more rehearsal you have, the less you have energy your brain has to spend to find that. Okay. So, can it become overwhelmed? Uh, typically because we do not always stimulate all of them at the same time except for when we reach the expert stage and we're combining those to do another skill set. Normally you're not overwhelmed. Okay. However, this gets to another question. Does anybody have anything about emotions? I do. Okay, what about? So I just wanted to know uh, the implications of when we try to tell ourselves to be rational, to make a decision, but emotionally make a decision. What is that? Okay. She's asking about whether or not you can separate irrationality or uh, being rational with emotional states. Write this down. There is no decision without emotion. In fact, it's physiologically impossible in the brain. The way the circuits go, the first stop is in the amygdala and in emotional memory tracks. The first stop. So you cannot make any decision without emotions. Now, can you learn, I think it was Plato who said, Learn to react to the right person in the right moment, in the right way, at the right time, with the right tone of voice. That is something that you can do top down, you know, sort of think about that. But the fact that the emotion will always be there is, is very important to remember. There's nobody, there's no such thing as pretending to be totally rational and thinking with a cool head is a better way to make a decision. Maybe that's a better way to interact with other people, but it's not true that you're not going to be experiencing that emotion. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Something you want to know about the brain. Anyway. So if the brain is always learning. So if your brain is always learning, and until you die, your brain is always making new connections, what's happening in the brain of somebody who might have Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is mis 
It's misnamed as a neurocognitive, a, neuro, a neurodegenerative disease, right? That's kind of not exactly right. The neuron, the, the neuronal body, often stays intact. What ends up uh, faltering is that from the neuron body, you have dendrites that stick out, and then you have the synapses to other neurons, right, where your memories, the connections are there, right? What happens is the neuronal body may stay intact, but the dendrites start to wither. They start to falter. Two things that are very important to know about this. The concept, write this down, use it or lose it, okay? One of the main problems that we have in the, in the loving communities that we have is that maybe mom or dad starts to forget things and they say, hey, come and live with me, okay, fine. And then they sit down and they sit, they, the lunchtime comes around and they say, oh, let me help you. And you say, no, 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 mom, it's okay, you sit down. Okay, so mom sits there like a vegetable and you have just condemned her to a faster decline. Use it or lose it. They looked at studies that said, okay, what helps prolong a person's life? Taking care of a dog, taking care of a plant, doing Sudoku, doing crossword puzzles, or learning or using a foreign language. Which one of these helps you live longer? All of them, all of them. Because the first two, like it's total guilt. You die, the dog dies, right? So you say, <laughs>
But then you go back down, you go to deep sleep. That's when you can't wake anybody up, right? That's as close to death as you get when you're alive. And you do these cycles several times a night, okay? The difficulty is, is if you are waking up naturally, okay, you go home tomorrow, Saturday, no alarm. Anytime you are waking up naturally, you are waking up from the dream state, okay? That's the norm, okay? Now, what is so important about sleep and learning is that there's a consolidation of memories only during dream state because there's a combination of neurotransmitters, chemicals in your brain that consolidate memory, but only if you're in dream state. And then when you go into these other states, it helps you rest and become focused. This is why. Mantra of learning. Two important things for learning are memory and attention. So, which does which? Dreaming or sleep? Which does which? One of them does memory and one of them does attention. Which does which? Memory is when you're dreaming and sleep is when you can pay attention. So if you slept well enough, you can pay attention. And if you have gone into dream states, you've consolidated memory. This is why in school we kind of it. You probably did this too when you were a kid, right? You study all night long for something. You think pulling an all-nighter is like the brilliant thing to do. And you get to class and you spew out these, you know, these answers and you get a good grade. But if I ask you the same questions 24 hours later, you don't remember anything, right? Basically because you have not consolidated that memory into long-term memory where it can become learning, where it can be really used and transferred in other contexts. So pulling all-nighters is not good for anybody. You might have good short-term results, but it's very bad. When you are sleep-deprived, what is your body more prone to do? Get sick, illness. There are so many wrong things about not sleeping well, guys. So how do you learn? Now, here's the thing that most people don't accept or believe or understand, but once you tell them, they think, oh, that makes sense. Sleep is a behavior. And like any behavior, it can be modified. So if you decide, I'm going to be a better sleeper, you can learn to do that. You can learn to sleep better. And I'd highly recommend it. It's one of the best things you can ever do. Many people, though, since you're not able, you can time, you can teach yourself. There's an app. It's called Sleep Cycle. It's free for the first month. Learn quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn in the, in the first month, I promise. What does it do? It basically says, you write in. The latest I can wake up is like 6.45, okay? So what does the app do? Because when you're in deep sleep, you're like not moving at all, and when you're in, in dream state, you're moving a bit more, it figures out if your sleep cycle is more like 70 minutes or more like 90 minutes or whatever it is, the average, and then it wakes you up right after you finish a dream state, which would be the most natural way to wake up. Try it this evening. It's so cool. I've been told because I don't have one. I don't have one because since I was 13, I trained myself to wake up. I always set an alarm just in case, but I never have to wake up with my alarm, even when I should be just like, right? I said, okay, I gotta get up. We had to take a plane yesterday at 5:30, so I had, oh, I'm gonna wake up at 4:25. So I wake up at 4:17 because that was as close to the dream state. That was the natural way to wake up. You can train yourself to sleep better. Think about that, okay? So. First thing is getting to bed nicely, the other thing is good sleep hygiene, and the other thing is how do you wake up. All of those things are important as far as learning is concerned. Okay? Somebody in the back? Somebody you want to know? Yes? Is there a time that the brain is most alert to that? It's always learning, but is there a time where it's most alert? Whenever is your moment that you have the best conditions for remembering and attention is your best time for learning. It is not that everybody is most alert at 9 in the morning or most alert at whatever. Another parenthesis about sleep. John, um, Alan J. Hobson at Harvard has spent like 40 years only studying sleep. If we put everybody into uh, dark rooms with no sound and just let people sleep at the pace that they'd like to, the average human being does not sleep 8 hours, go to work 8 hours, and have 8 hours of leisure time. That is contrived by society. If we could do whatever we wanted to do, more or less four hour cycles. So this is why when people say, well, I'm a morning person, I'm a night person, yeah, but that's totally individual. It's the moment that you will feel most alert. There's no such thing as blanketly saying everybody is most alert in certain moment. Yeah. Okay. Do you, yes, go ahead. Uh, understanding that the, the 
He said, the brain is reorganizing itself in adolescence. You know, okay, that's cool. The brain is still reorganizing itself in the early 20s. And he's the one who upped your insurance. He said, the brain is organizing itself until 25 years of age, right? And that's when they're doing the camera in a car. Okay, what he figured out, this is what was so interesting about this shift, is that what, what do we stop doing around 22, 24, 25? What, what do we stop doing? Going to school, okay? So, if you were to have managed, keep watching these brains, which he is, into later life, again, use it or lose it. So the more you continually are learning new things, are curious about things, reading on something else, diving deeper into new information, keeping your brain active, the better it gets at whatever, you're, whatever it is you're practicing. If you say, I need to enhance my recall, then practice. There's a woman in my class last semester, lover, 70 years old. Mm -hmm. And when I told her this, she says, okay. And she set out, she just sent me an email last week. She is the memory champion of Florida now. <laughs> she can memorize, she, you know that one where they put all the, the cards, like, you know, 300 quarter cards, and you have to, like, memorize? She's the champion. <laughs> because you can do it, okay? Anybody can do any, but, you know, she spent the past year doing this, though. Okay, so her devotion to the task was also unique, right? Just be happy, aware. The great news in all of this is your brain is incredibly plastic throughout the lifespan. Our challenge is to decide, okay, how much am I going to commit to this new learning? Because cognitive load is going to say, oh, this hurts to learn this, okay? But that's okay. Get over that hump. The more you do it, the easier things get. The problem is just to accept. You know, learning is not the easiest thing in the world. We sell these networks. A lot of stuff has to happen, right? But it is always possible to learn more and okay, to go deeper. So you're going to do something for me now. Remember I said you were going to have to do a three, two, one? Is it possible you heard three things that you didn't know before? Two things that you're like, oh, I want to know more about this other thing. Especially since you didn't ask that question because we didn't have enough time. One hour is not enough time. Two things I want to know more about. And one thing that you might think I'm going to do differently in my own life, professionally or personally, based on this information about how my brain learns. Just take a time to write this down. Uh, in Cascade, I the three things that are new could be the two things you want to know more about, which could be the one thing you need to They don't have to be the six separate things. I'm going to wrap up by telling you one thing. Your brain cannot not learn. And that's kind of a powerful thing to understand. That's basically evolution. You just can't. It's survival. We learn just because that's what your brain does, okay? But you guys will understand, you know this on a daily basis, that there are things that are called risk factors and protective factors. Some things that will block the way you're able to learn, your natural flow of things, and some things that protect you from that. And I just want to motivate you to identify and also flip. Risk and protective factors always have the same roots. So what you do is when you can identify where your risk factor is, can we tip that to the other side? How do you do that? That's one of the best ways to sort of get over this and to be able to learn throughout our lifespan. That's what our jobs are. That's what life is, is to learn. So how can we make this the most natural thing possible? Okay? If any of you feel brave when you walk up that, when you walk back up to your office, say out loud to somebody else, well, I'm going to change this. And the minute you said it, that's a promise, right? <laughs> so, so that might be a little bit too much for some people. But if you feel comfortable and would like to, I highly, highly motivate you to uh, write to me and to say, well, these are the two things I want to follow up on, and, and where do I start? Where's some good information? Or I was reading this. Is this really junk? <laughs> or is this really good stuff? I just ask, because maybe I won't know it, but I will know other people who might know it, and I will try to help you find the highest quality evidence to base the information on from here on out, okay? Thank you so much for your attention. Sorry.